I'm uh, Fox Harrell. I'm associate professor here of digital media. Uh, I run a lab called the Imagination, Computation, and Expression Laboratory, focused on combining computer science, cognitive science, and digital media arts for interactive narrative, gaming, and social media related systems. Uh, and one of the things that we're excited to do this year is to start off a series which is called uh, The Cognitive Dimensions of Media to bring in a series of people who are thinking about uh, media from a cognitive perspective, but not just from uh, uh, a kind of uh, older fashion, cognition is everything just in the head perspective, but really looking at cognition as embodied, uh, as distributed amongst uh, society and amongst artifacts and situated in particular social context. And today we're uh, honored, as I'll introduce uh, in a moment, to have uh, uh, Professor George Lakoff out here from uh, UC Berkeley. The discussion will be uh, moderated by Professor Heather Hendershot. Uh, she is a professor of film and media studies here, uh, here in the front uh, row. Uh, she is in the communication study, uh, communication compared to media studies department. She's written on right wing uh, broadcasting, on children's programming. She's the editor of Cinema Journal, also the author of uh, multiple notable books. This uh, talk series is also co-sponsored by the Communications Forum. And uh, today, we're very pleased to introduce a distinguished speaker, who is uh, uh, George Lakoff, as you know, who needs no introduction, but uh, we'll get one anyway. Uh, so, uh, so he graduated from here in uh, 1962. So uh, double major, course uh, 21, and uh, mathematics, that's uh, uh, writing, uh, mathematics, studied literature, uh, luminary figures uh, are here, Roman Jakobson, helped bridging uh, poetics uh, along with uh, linguistics, one of the first people in, the, in uh, students in the linguistics department here. And uh, especially notably, he was a pioneer of incorporating logic-based approaches into linguistics, so using mathematics to express linguistics uh, uh, concepts. Uh, on the other hand, uh, he's also notable for uh, running up against not only the innovations of that approach, but also some of the challenges and limitations. And so uh, pioneered also the kind of embodied cognition approach uh, that involves movement, emotions, uh, affective disposition, perception, and, and much more within uh, cognitive science. Uh, and What's even more exciting to me is that it's a particular kind of cognition that looks at the central role of poetic thinking, that's figurative uh, thinking, metaphor, and the way that these kinds of figurative and poetic and literary uh, thought are the basis for everyday uh, cognition. Uh, so much of, most of you probably already know a lot, a lot of this uh, work. He segued into also work on moral politics using Cognitive Science uh, Foundation. His most recent book is The Little Blue Book. Uh, you know, his classic books I suspect you also already know. And so I want you to join me in welcoming uh, very warmly Professor uh, George Lakoff. <laughs> up there yet? Um, I don't think that's, yes, it's there. Great. All right, thank you all for coming. It's great to be back at MIT. Um, yeah, uh, I've been there a few times uh, since I graduated 50 years ago, and it's changed a bit. Uh, this spot used to be the Neko factory from Neko wafers uh, and smelled all over campus. But uh, this is a lot better. Um, I want to begin uh, by talking about metaphorical thought. And I wanna, I'm going to break it down in three parts. First that, then the neural theory of thought and language, and then what the brain tells us about politics. And uh, let me tell you a bit about how I got into the study of metaphorical thought. Uh, in 1978, in February, uh, I was teaching a freshman, not a freshman, an undergraduate seminar at Berkeley with six students sitting around a table about this size. And um, uh, I had um, given out various papers to read, uh, and one of them was a paper on metaphor by a noted philosopher. Uh, which I didn't think was a very good paper, but we were going to read it. And um, the, uh, it was raining, as it's always raining in Berkeley in February. Uh, and um, on that day, one of the young women in the class came in a little bit late, drenched and in tears. And she sat down across the table. She was about, you know, four feet away. And uh, she was crying. And no everybody tried not to notice 
that she was crying. Uh, so we went around the table. What is, you know, Professor so-and-so says this in this article. What do you think about that? We get to her, and she says, I'm sorry. I've got a metaphor problem with my boyfriend. <laughs> Maybe you guys can help. Well, this is Berkeley in 1978. We all said, sure. <laughs> and we all knew what to do. So we started an instant support group. And we said, well, you know, uh, what did he say? And she said, well, he said that our relationship had hit a dead end street. And I don't know what he means by this. So we said, well, look, we started immediately doing linguistic field work. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, what, is, what could he mean? Uh, you know, if you can't keep going the way you've been going, you may have to turn back. And then we started noticing that there was certain expressions uh, about uh, love using a travel vocabulary. So we, you know, this is a linguistics class. I say, hey, that's interesting. Let's make a list. Linguists do this. How many expressions can we find of, uh, about love from travel? Well, uh, you know, there's lots of them. Uh, it's been a long, bumpy road. The marriage is on the rocks. We're spinning our wheels in this relationship. Uh, the, the, the relationship is off the track. We're going in different directions. We may have to bail out, and so on. And um, in fact, the young woman was a disc jockey on the local radio show at camp, on campus. And she said, oh, yeah, there's been a, uh, uh, a new rock song came out this week with the lyrics, uh, we're um, driving in the fast lane on the freeway of love. And everybody understood this. Well, uh, you know, now I'm a linguistics professor, and so um, I realized that um, there was a problem immediately. Uh, Aristotle, uh, 2,500 years before, by all means, come on down. We have chairs. Don't, don't, don't be shy. <laughs> you know, lots and lots of seats. Don't, don't worry about it. Come on in. Lots of seats down here, in the middle, you know, in front. Come on. <laughs> so. 2,500 years ago, Aristotle said that uh, metaphor was a matter of language and uh, of similarities. And uh, it was all a matter of uh, special language that occurred in, in poetry or in politics and things like that, but wasn't ordinary, the ordinary use of language. And I realized, first of all, that uh, what was going on was, did not quite fit what Aristotle said because you had lots of different linguistic expressions, but they all had the same conceptual metaphor. They were all understood in terms of love as a journey of a certain kind. And so I said, well, this is interesting. Well, we have a nice list. Is there any generalization about this list? So we sat down. We said, uh, OK, um, notice in each case, the lovers are travelers. In each case, the relationship is some kind of vehicle, a car, a train, a plane, a boat, whatever. Uh, and in each case, uh, the difficulties are impediments to travel. And in each case, the lovers are trying to get to some common destination, uh, which meant their common life goals. And the problem, and, and every expression was a problem with getting there. Okay? So we write this down, and you know, it looks kind of like a mapping in math. You write it down, you have a little arrow, you go to that. And there were little four little arrows, and there was a little nice little mapping. And so um, I said, hey, isn't that cool? And the young woman said, I don't care about your <laughs> mapping. My boyfriend is breaking up with me. He's thinking in terms of this metaphor. I said, well, that's interesting. How do you think in terms of a metaphor? How does this work? Let's take an example. We're spinning our wheels in this relationship. Well, what do we know? Um, is there a mental image here? Uh, where are the wheels? Where are the wheels, guys? They're, oh, are they on something? Or are they just wheels? They're on a car or, you know, or a little truck or whatever. Yeah, they're on a car. And they're spinning. Is the car moving? No. Do you want it to be moving? Are you putting any energy into it? How do you feel? How did you all know the right answer? Right? Everybody knows the right answer. But now, if you take that mapping and you say, what happens? It says, you're in a relationship. It's not going anywhere. You're not making progress towards your common life goals. 
you're putting a lot of energy into it and you're frustrated. That's what it means to you know, be spinning your wheels in a relationship. That is, there's an inference from this. There's metaphorical reasoning going on. That mapping is taking what you know about the, what we'll call the source domain of travel and mapping it on to love. Aristotle didn't say that. Not only that, it's trickier. Because I had previously spent, uh, from 1963 until then, about 15 years, trying to get logic to work for natural language. And trying to get the, the theory that meaning was based on truth conditions to work. Right? Now, if meaning is based on truth conditions, on how words fit the world or symbols fit the world, where, the, where is this metaphor? Can't be in the world. Can't be in the relationship between that and the world. It's got to be in your head. Wait a minute. That's not what philosophers say. <laughs> That's not what Anglo-American philosophy teaches. It's not even what postmodernist uh, European philosophy teaches. Something is wrong here, or maybe right. Something interesting has just happened. There is metaphorical thought. And the metaphorical thought is in, form, in the form of a mapping from one domain of experience to another. And it has lots of different, very different expressions with different meanings, but they're all part of that generalization. That's cool. OK, um, the woman did not make up with her boyfriend, but she graduated, got her PhD, got a nice job, met a nice guy who also, they both got tenure and they're fine. <laughs> and she's even a department chairman right now, but I won't tell you where. Now, um, the main part of this is that for, after that, I spent about a year collecting examples of this. And a year later, Mark Johnson happened to show up in Berkeley and we happened to start working uh, on a book uh, and three months later, there was a book called Metaphors We Live By that came out. Uh, and uh, we had to finish it in three months because Mark had to go on vacation with his wife. He promised his wife he would leave. So we finished it in three months. Now, the big thing about that was we noticed that there were lots and lots of other metaphors, metaphorical thought. And in particular, we noticed that some of them had to do with the body. So for example, uh, something like um, uh, happy is up and sad is down. I'm feeling up today, I'm depressed, I'm down, and in the dumps, et cetera, right? That has to do with the way your body works. Uh, and we found lots of others that had to do with experience, like uh, more is up and less is down. Why every time you pour water in the glass, the ever level goes up. You pile more, pile more stuff on the table, the level goes up. Every day, all around the world, this happens. So we started looking at the ones that were like that. And then we noticed something about good old love as a journey, that it de got decomposed, could be decomposed into other conceptual metaphors that had to do with embodiment. In particular, why is it that you have um, uh, journeys being understood as reaching goals? Achieving a goal is, you know, uh, is reaching a destination. And a difficulty is something that stops you from reaching that goal. Well, think about it for a minute. Uh, every day, you know, you want a coffee, you've got to go to where they sell the coffees. Uh, you want a cold beer, you've got to go to the fridge. Constantly, every baby wants his blankie, he's got to crawl over and get it. You know, wants to be snuggly, you've got to get into bed. I mean, this is crucial. Every day of your life, there's a correlation in your experience between uh, achieving a purpose and reaching a destination. Just as there's, there's a correlation in experience between um, pouring water into the glass, getting more water, and seeing the level go up. And we started noticing lots of those. For example, you also have things like, why is it that a relationship uh, is a vehicle? One. Relationships are containers. You're in a relationship, you enter a relationship, you can leave a relationship, you can be deep into a relationship, et cetera, okay? It's a container. Why is it a container? 
When you're a kid, you live with your relatives, your relations, in one contained place. Yeah, very simple. Correlation and experience. Intimacy is closeness. You're close in this car. Why is intimacy in closest? The people you're most intimate with are the people you've been close to from the time you're a kid. Um, why is it that it's a, what about vehicles? Vehicles are used to take you places, purposes or destinations, right? So there's a reason why the relationship is a vehicle in there, but it has to do with embodied experience. But then there's a further thing that we noticed when we started looking around at other cultures, the embodied experience cases seem to be widespread around the world, if not universal, because many of the experiences are universal. But things like love as a journey is not universal. There are lots of cultures that don't have that. So we sort of wondered, why should that be? Well, we noticed also that you have a metaphor that life is a journey but a very different kind. But it's interesting, uh, and there's a reason for it. There's a general metaphor that goes like this, that action is motion. So uh, you know, uh, a careful action is careful motion, like uh, walking on eggshells, uh, walking a fine line, things like that. And, and we can go through that. There's a long list of these action is motion cases. And achieving a purpose is reaching a destination, so a purposeful action is motion toward a destination. And then what's a life? It's a sequence of actions toward some des various destinations. But in this culture, there's something more. We require a purposeful life. You're supposed to be achieving life goals, not just immediate goals like what am I going to do for dinner or something like that, but life goals. Now, we even have documents for this. They're called curriculum vitae, the run of life, the course of life, right? And uh, you're supposed to tell where you are at various courses, uh, places in life. And you all know about these documents. You write them, and you've seen them, and you read them all the time. Now, uh, so this is important. And then, well, well, how does that relate to love as a journey? Think about two people in a long-term love relationship. They're supposed to, both of them are supposed to have purposes in life, but they're supposed to be compatible purposes in life. And have you ever had the problem of having such compatible purposes in life? Yeah, I have, and many of you have, like you. <laughs> right? I mean, it's not so easy to be in a long-term love relationship where there are compatible purposes in life. And this metaphor is about those difficulties. Right? Now, when you put all this together, you find out that you have a structure that is very interesting. And it's a hierarchical structure where, let's put at the top, just for the sake of uh, you know, uh, the embodied metaphors that are basic, we call them primary metaphors, the ones that are widespread around the world. And here you go, action is motion, purposes are destinations, and they entail the difficulties are impediments to reaching a destination. And there is a composite metaphor, purposeful action is motion to a destination, and that fits certain frames. A life is a sequence of actions performed over a lifetime, and there's a structure, a sequence of regions uh, of life, like childhood, adulthood, and so on. Now, you also have entailed metaphors like a life is a sequence of motions, and so on. A purposeful, purposeful life is a sequence of motions toward destinations. <coughs> Sorry. Difficulties in a purposeful life are impediments to reaching those. And a journey is a long sequence of motions to one or more destinations, so you get life is a journey, and there's a cultural norm. People are expected to have purposes in life. Love is a journey has this cultural norm. Lovers in a long-term relationship are expected to have compatible purposes in life. That entails a metaphor. Compatible purposes are common destinations. Uh, this is all metaphorical logic. Uh, a relationship is a container, a bounded region in space. Intimacy is closeness. And you get a vehicle as a means of reaching destinations. In a two-person vehicle, the travelers are close. The vehicle is solid, can last a long time. A two-person vehicle is a means for reaching common destinations. And then you get 
A long-term re love relationship is a two-person vehicle. Lovers are travelers, et cetera, all of those. Uh, a long-term re love, re love relationship is a means for reaching common life goals. The difficulties are impediments. And relationship difficulties are impediments to reaching compatible destinations. To understand something like the marriage is on the rocks, you have to know all of that. <laughs> and you have an image, a cultural image, the boat on the rocks. And in that, the boat is the vehicle. The boat on the rocks can't move, can be damaged, can be less solid, the travelers can be hurt. A possibility of getting off the rocks is, is you know, uh, there's possible, but it, you could do it. And then there are mappings. The boat is the relationship. The motion is progress toward common life goals. And there are inferences. The lo lovers could be psychologically harmed. The life will likelihood the relationship will last is lowered, and so on. That is, you take your knowledge about the boat on the rocks for the marriages on the rocks. You apply the general mapping. And you have to have all of that together to know what that means. All of it at once. And there are lots of other cases. The train off the track, the marriage is off, the relationship's off the track. You know, the track often can't move. The dead end street case, the spinning its wheels case, car being stuck, we're stuck in this relationship. We gotta bail out, it's been a long bumpy road, we're not going anywhere, this is a, a wreck, <laughs> and so on. Notice each of them is a different specific metaphor with different entailments. But the entailments come from knowledge about the image, apply that mapping, and you get the meaning of the specific metaphor. So what you have are primary metaphors that are based on experience and embodied experience. You have composite metaphors and lots of inferences that go on, that whole thing. You have cultural norms you have to be concerned with. And then each of these fits the composite metaphor, and they each give different entailments depending on what the metaphor maps. That is how metaphor works, and it's conceptual. And then the language fits the image. And then you ask, well, how many images do, like that do you have? And the answer is tens of thousands. That's what it means to, to know a culture. Okay? Now, what is this list of, of relationships? Uh, within the neural theory of language and thought, it's called a cascade. Cascades in the brain are uh, circuits that control the activation of things going on all over the brain, at, often at once. And that's what you need here. Okay, So that's a nice example of what a mer metaphor is. You got a simple case, and you can see what you're going to need in a brain-based theory of this is cascades of at least this complexity. Okay, Normal. Is that cool? How many of cascades are there going to be? A lot. All right, how does the brain do this? How many neurons you have? 100 billion at birth. How many connections to other neurons for each of them? Between 1,000 and 10,000. It gives you about a quadrillion connections at birth. By the time you're five, about half of them have died, the ones that are least used, which is why you need early childhood education. Okay, But that only leads you with half a quadrillion connections. <laughs> right? Now, every thought you have, we'll go to this. But first of all, the, there's a, a general point here. You know, that is, we have primary metaphors, specific knowledge, all of these things we just said. Okay? And notice, if you ignore the general me metaphor and just do the analysis on the specific cases, there would be dozens of different journey metaphors, and you wouldn't see any generalization across them. And you wouldn't be able to, to know what a, a, new, a new rock song meant. Okay? Now, so the point here is important. Metaphor is a natural mode of thought. It arises spontaneously. It shapes how we think, how we reason, how we understand the world. Mathematics is also cognitively a system of precise embodied metaphors. And Rafael Nunez and I have a 600-page book full, in full detail, easy to read, but in lots of fun. But it goes through, I was an undergraduate math major here. It goes through what I learned in my undergraduate math curriculum in detail of what the metaphors are precisely in formal terms. 
And what it shows is we th what advanced math is, is a, a, a cascade of metaphors that start with things like arithmetic and geometry and so on, and then build metaphorically on those. And those are metaphorically based on experiences like putting things in containers and taking them out, which is why uh, addition is adding something and subtraction is taking, taken away. Uh, it has to do with, with taking steps as you move, uh, you know, which is why you have uh, the number line and so on. And what we do is we work out the entailments of those metaphors in full detail in this book. And it's cheap. <laughs> you can pick it up, uh, you know, go and get one, and, and, you'll, and not only that, it shows that formulas mean things. Mathematical formulas mean things. And the way we set up the book was this. My favorite formula when I was in high school was e to the pi i plus 1 equals 0, right? Great. Euler metaphor, uh, we show what it means and why it's true, and showing that it, it requires putting together metaphors from five branches of mathematics. It's an 80-page demonstration at the end of the book. Enjoy it if you're into this. Now, also scientific theories use conceptual metaphor in their content. Think of space-time, you know, where Time is understood in terms of space, which is a standard metaphor we have for understanding uh, space in terms of time, not just here, but around the world. So uh, basically, metaphor is central in both technical and everyday reasoning, and it's everywhere. Now, the problem with this is it contradicts what I learned here as the theory of rationality and reason. Here's what I learned. Thought is conscious, as Descartes said. This is straight out of 1650. Um, so thought is conscious. Thought is abstract, not physical. Emotion gets in the way of reason. Reason uses mathematical logic. Reason can directly fit the world. Reason is what makes us human. Therefore, all humans have the same reason. The job of reason is to serve our interests, and words are defined by conditions of truth in the world. What cognitive science and neuroscience have shown is that every part of that is false. Every single part, all right? Now, um, just to give you a sense of that, before we go through the new theory, let me go through some of this. First, about 98% of thought is unconscious. It could not be conscious, because consciousness is linear, and thought is massively parallel. It could not be conscious, and it isn't. And it's well below the consciousness. Thought is not abstract. It's all physical. If you don't have the neural circuitry, for, for the right neural circuitry for understanding something, you won't understand it. You can only understand what the circuitry of your brain allows you to understand. And that is profound when it comes to politics, as you really will see. <laughs> you should, you're laughing, huh? You should be crying. <laughs> uh, it's unfortunately true. Emotion does not get in the way of reason. Emotion is required for reason. There's a marvelous book on this by Tony Damasio called Descartes' Error. Tony is one of our great neuroscientists. And uh, for many years, he, studied, he has studied people with brain lesions, particularly those who've had car accidents or strokes and so on. And there's one, there are certain people who lose the ability to feel emotion because of strokes or, or lesions. And when that happens, they like and not like don't mean anything, and they can't tell if anybody else would like or not like what they do. So they can't set goals. They can't set goals. They can't rationally pursue any goals because they can't set any goals. And they wind up acting kind of randomly, screwing up their lives in most cases. This is a deep point. You must be rational. I mean, you must be emotional to be rational. You can't be rational without emotions. Not there, not possible, right? Next, uh, reason does not just use mathematical logic. It uses metaphor. It uses uh, what are called frames that we'll get to. It uses uh, what are called image schemas. We'll get to those. But it uses, certainly, it uses lots and lots and lots of metaphors. Uh, 
Reason presumably is what makes us human, therefore we all have the same reason. Not true. Just think about the Republican and Democratic national conventions. Not the same reason. Right? And we'll talk about that in a while. We don't all have the same reason. We have different neural circuitry for doing reasoning. Next, the job of reason is supposed to be to serve our interests. Well, it is to a large extent. It's not false. But there's another thing even more important. Uh, in the early to mid-1990s, there was a great discovery made in Parma, Italy, uh, in the neuroscience group there, the discovery of mirror neuron circuitry. Now, uh, and I worked with one of the discoverers, Vittorio Galesi, in some uh, detail, working on the primary data that they had. And um, it basically, the, the, think of it this way. They started out with doing research on macaques, and they have put probes in the macaque's brain where they can go neuron by neuron and see in the premotor cortex, which choreographs what's going on in the motor cortex, they, they put probes in to see what would happen when they trained the monkey to uh, peel bananas, uh, you know, um, crush peanuts, uh, pull, uh, push on bars, uh, pull on ropes, and so on. They, they taught the monkey to do these things, and as they did them, you know, different neurons would fire, and they kept track by computer of exactly what neurons would fire. And to make sure the computer was operating, they made it go click, 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 so they could hear that it was working, okay? So uh, Vittorio is running this one day. Everything's going fine. He goes out to lunch, comes back. He's still a little hungry. There's a pile of bananas. He goes to peel a banana, and he hears click, 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 click. But the, the machine's tied up to the monkey, not him. Why? They check the data, and it turns out that the banana peeling part of the brain of the monkey was engaged. And then they tested, and they found out that the same uh, part of the brain that was used for acting was used when you perceived the same action done by someone else. Well, that's the mythology. The reality is more complicated and interesting. It's only 30% of those neurons. The other neurons are doing more interesting stuff, like uh, giving a semantic hierarchy, going through the semantic sequences of act parts of the action, uh, you know, saying what's central, when it's finished, when it's beginning, doing all kinds of other things uh, as well as, uh, you know, for both uh, seeing and doing. But there's circuitry that links seeing and doing, and then they trace the circuitry to the parietal cortex, premotor to parietal, not that far. And we learned we have, we're born with that circuitry, and then it gets tuned as we grow up to, to fit what we see and what we do. In addition, that circuitry in premotor cortex is connected to the emotional regions. What that means is that through, we know from Paul Ekman's work that there's a physiology of emotions. You go around the world and you know people are happy, smile, and smiles look the same way and use the same muscles. And if you're sad, other, other muscles are involved. And if you're angry, you bare your teeth, and so on. There's a whole physiology of emotions that has been studied in great detail. And that means that the physiology, which is controlled by the premotor cortex, is connected to the emotions, which allows you to tell when someone else is happy, or someone else is in pain, or someone else is sad or angry. It is the basis of empathy. It also allows you to tell when someone else picks up a bottle like this and goes like this that I'm about to take a drink. And I was. And you could tell. <laughs> and then they found out that there are what are called canonical neurons. So um, those are oh, a few millimeters away along a certain ridge. And they fire when either you perform an action or you see something you can perform it on, like this bottle. See? Wouldn't you like a drink? Now, we are evolutionarily constructed to have brains that connect with other people emotionally and with what they're doing. And by the way, the mirror neurons fire more in cooperative action than in just you know, noticing. In addition, we are set up to 
connect with the world. What is a canonical neuron? It fires when you perform the normal canonical action of this. So yeah, I hold this up and you have taking a drink, not sticking it in my ear. All right, that's not the canonical action. This is it. And that's what's important here. We are, we are environmentally linked to objects in the world via what we normally canonically do with those objects in the world. That's wild. And that says the job of reason is everything to do with connecting to things in the world via our bodies and connecting to other people via our bodies. Not just carrying out our goals, which is also important. And then what does this say about the idea that reason can directly fit the world? It can only fit it via our bodies, via our, the way our brain and body connects us to the world. If, you know, you can't just, it doesn't just fit automatically. You've got to be able to connect to your body, connect to your brain, and then you might be able to get the fit, but the only fit is what your brain allows you to understand. Okay? Words fit these neural structures. They fit frames, they fit metaphors, and so on. Words don't directly connect the things in the world. Okay? So that is pretty cool. So here you have a new theory of real reason. It's based on what, putting together neuroscience, neural computation, cognitive linguistics, and embodied cognition experiments. And this is the basic idea. We think with our brains. All thought is physical, carried out by neural circuitry. Most thought, almost the, usually 98% is the estimate, is unconscious. You can only understand what your neural circuitry allows you to understand. Emotion is needed for reason. Rationality requires emotion. The basic mechanisms of thought, thought are embodied conceptual primitives. Now, these are interesting. Um, they are what are called schema circuits, and they have embodied roles and so on. Let me explain what they are. Uh, there are spatial circuits for things like um, uh, containment. Something is in or out of something, so you have that. You have uh, a container schema has an interior, exterior, and a boundary. Uh, a motion schema has a source, a path, and a goal, and so on. Those are called semantic roles, and we have lots of them, dozens if not hundreds of those. Uh, we have action schemas that carry those out. Srini Narayanan uh, figured out how they work uh, back in 1995, uh, and uh, what he showed was that you can model them computationally, um, uh, you know, using uh, standard kinds of computation fixed up a lot to make it look neural. Uh, and um, they have structure. And he, what he did was show what it would take to model the, uh, the, uh, the kinds of actions you perform with your body. He did this for lots and lots of bodily actions and found that the same structure was used for all of them. And when he showed up with that structure, I noticed that that structure shows up in every language of the world. It's called aspect in linguistics. And what it means is it's the structure of actions and events as they are structured in every language. So we have things like, um, I'm about to take a drink, Begin just before the beginning. I started to take a drink. I picked this up. I'm taking a drink. I'm in the middle. I'm still taking a drink. I'm checking to see if I'm still thirsty. No, I'm fine. Then I can put it down. I finish. And after I'm done, there's a consequence. I have taken a drink. That's what have with en means, and so on. And every language of the world can express st stuff like that. Now, so process, those are called process schemas, sometimes called X schemas or executing schemas. And then there's neural binding. If you're going to put together various metaphors to form complex metaphors, they have to be bound. Nothing moves in the brain, so you have to have circuitry that binds them together, called neural binding. And we're working out theories of neural binding right now. Uh, there are frames, what are called frame circuits, for uh, framing uh, actions, like uh, riding on a boat, for example, or driving a car. Uh, there are what are called metonymic mappings, where you say things like, we need a strong arm at third base, where the arm stands for the person. 
um, and lots of others. Uh, the White House isn't talking, uh, or is talking, as in the, the um, cartoons. Uh, there are metaphorical mappings that you've seen. These are neural uh, mappings. The primary ones are for body schemas, et cetera, and there are composite ones that are bindings, and so on. Now, how does this happen? And what's interesting is that Narayanan, in his dissertation, after he worked out how actions worked for concrete actions, I then asked him, OK, if you can do that, can you get a logic of abstract actions and abstract events? Well, he said, to do that, you need metaphor to map from the more embodied ones to the, quote, abstract ones. They turn out not to be abstract. We'll get there in a minute to the other ones that are not physically out there in the world. And so he picked the domain of international economics, where an economy goes forward, up or down, or into depressions and recessions, and gets pulled out or not, and so on. And then he went online to the New York Times business section, the Wall Street Journal, and The Economist with uh, a list of simple actions that uh, he had analyzed in terms of what your body did. Uh, so things like uh, uh, India is stumbling toward uh, economic liberalization, or um, France fell into a recession pulled out by Germany, et cetera. And he asked, uh, could you then create a neural, a computational neural theory of metaphor that would go along with the, the, what the body does to give you all the right inferences? And he did. That was his dissertation in 1997. And uh, the idea is basically this, that how do you learn, let's say, uh, uh, affection is warmth, okay? We all have that, you know, he's a warm person, he's cool to me, et cetera, okay? Uh, how do you, you know, how do you learn that? Well, you're held affectionately by your parents and you feel their bodily warmth. What's happening in your brain? Two different parts of the brain are activated, one for temperature, one for affection. They're in different parts of the brain. Okay? Same thing for more is up. There's a part of the brain that registers verticality and a part that registers quantity. So what happens when they are activated over and over together? Well, the more you activate a neural circuit, the stronger it gets. And since each neuron is connected to lots of others and the circuit is not just on one neuron at a time, it's a neuronal group of usually several hundred neurons. You have connections along existing pathways, and those, you get spreading activation along that, and then you get more spreading activation, and it gets stronger each time via Hebbian learning, because uh, neurons that fire together wire together, and so you get Hebbian learning, and you get uh, the shortest connection between these is eventually found, and you form a circuit. But at this point, you get uh, spike time-dependent plasticity coming into effect, which adjusts the structure of the circuits. What that does is strengthen connections that are in the direction of more spiking and weaken ones that are in the direction of less first spiking. Now, what determines more spiking and less spiking in the metaphor cases? Let's take affection is warmth. Your brain is always uh, computing temperature, but not always computing affection. Your brain is always computing verticality, even when you sleep in order to turn over, but not always computing quantity. So what's going on is that when you have more going on, more input, you're going to get more first spiking, and you're going to get asymmetric uh, con connections. And metaphors are asymmetric. Now, we then checked out several hundred of these primary metaphors, and they all work. We can predict the directionality of the metaphors on the basis of the neural circuitry. Is that cool? I like it. Uh, this is all Srini's work. Um, I didn't do it. He did it. Now, so. Um, what we have is a thing called cascade theory. A cascade is a neural pathway along which you have circuits that determine 
the activation flow in the brain. And that's what Srini first did when he was looking at the activation flow for act simple actions, for a sequence of actions. It determined the activation flow in the brain, but activation flow in the premotor cortex. But this, the same mathematics and the same circuitry, the same neural computation will work for all flows of activation in the brain. And we're now working out all the circuitry for frames, metaphors, etc., for how that works, and that's called cascade theory. And we know that there are cascades for lots of other things, and I, if you want, I can go through some others later that we know exist. But that's what we're going to need. Uh, and um, flow along a cascade can originate either internally or externally. That is, can be perceived, something you hear in language, or you can make it up. Not only that, you can make up things internally that can't exist, like flying pigs. Right? Now, imagine a flying pig. Okay? How does it fly? What allows it to fly? Wings. Where are the wings? Are the wings on its feet? On the back. Which way is the snout oriented? in the direction of motion. You all know the answer to that. How did you know it? <laughs> right? You knew it because you could do neural binding of pigs and birds. This, this is pigasus, by the way. <laughs> you could do neural binding of pigasus, and you know the optimal binding, which is called best fit, which we'll talk about in a while. And that allows you to create something internally that can't exist. But flying pig, there another, is another kind of flying pig uh, called super swine. Uh, he has a cape <laughs> and goes like this, right, and so on. OK. And you now understand super swine instantly. You know, it, you know. So you can do this, and you do it internally or externally. Now, what does all this have to do with politics? So I'm going to zip ahead. Uh, and go on to politics from all of this. I won't go through all of the, the details of this. Best fit is going to be in there, et cetera. Best fit is interesting because it, has, it comes from uh, the fact that we're a physical system and we use conservation of energy. And the neurons, uh, the neural circuits uh, that are activated are the ones that will use the least overall energy, and that is the ones with the strongest connections. And you can model that computationally by base nets, uh, which is what's been done uh, in our lab. Now, what does this have to do with politics? First, Charles Fillmore, back in 1975, observed that language is defined relative to what are called frames. They are stru neural structures in the brain that have various roles. Uh, classic example of Roger Shanks, the restaurant frame. You have a waiter, you have a chef, you have a customer, you have a menu, you have a dish. Those are the roles, and you know the order in which things occur. That's a scenario that fits. That defines a frame, and then there are various inferences from that. Okay? So those are real, and uh, metaphors map from frame to frame. What's interesting is that negating a frame activates the frame neurally. Just, that's why I wrote a book called Don't Think of an Elephant. Makes you think of an elephant. Nixon said, I am not a crook. <laughs> okay. yeah, uh, who's the, uh, uh, Christine, what's her name, uh, in running uh, in uh, South, was it, in the Carolinas, said, I am not a witch. Remember that one? <laughs> anyway, is it Delaware? She said, I am not a witch. It cost her the election. <laughs> For good reason. Now, uh, the more a frame is activated, the stronger the frame circuitry gets. They come in hierarchies. Now, the crucial thing is all politics is moral. Now, in case that isn't obvious, it's very simple. Think of it this way. Every political leader gets up and says, here's what you should do. We should pass this legislation, that legislation, etc., because it's right. Nobody gets up and says, do it because it's wrong. It's evil, do it. Or it doesn't matter, do it. The assumption is it's right. They just have different ideas about what right is, different moralities. 
What that means is that there is a frame hierarchy, which we know exists, and that the highest part of that hierarchy is in politics is moral, and that everything in the frame hierarchy, all those policies have to fit the moral system. And these morals, I described these moral systems in a book called Moral Politics in 1996. Now, um, and we'll talk about it in a while, but they have very different moral systems. Now, the moral systems are general. The policies that fit them are specific. So you have lots of cascades going on. Now, interestingly, very important to know is by conceptualism. There are a lot of people who are partly conservative and partly progressive. Normally, this means that they have both neural circuitries in, their, in the same brain. Now, they contradict each other. How is that possible? The answer is very simple, mutual inhibition. There are circuits in the brain, all over the brain, where one circuit inhibits the other. The activation of one turns the other off. Right? Now, this isn't just in politics with moral systems. Think about the following. There are cases where, you, where many, many people have two opposed moral systems, and they don't even notice when they switch. Just think Saturday night and Sunday morning. Okay. Okay. Very common. This is not, an, this is not a weird uh, phenomenon. So many people are biconceptual, and usually in politics, they are, have different moral systems applying to different things. So they're not applying to the same thing. They're you know, conservative about some things and others. And they're called moderates, swing voters, et cetera. But what is a moderate? It's somebody who is largely conservative but uh, progressive about something or other, or largely progressive but conservative about something or other. And then there are swing voters. Okay. Now, how do you influence a moderate, or an independent, or a swing voter, or biconceptual? You use your language to activate your moral system to strengthen it and weaken the other. The last thing you do is use their language. Conservatives are taught this in training institutes, like the Leadership Institute in Virginia that trains tens of thousands of conservatives every year. And they are spread in, along, around the country and in other countries. Uh, they're in Europe, they're in Canada, they're in Australia, they're in Korea, et cetera. And they're taught how to think and talk conservative and what to do and what not to do. But our guys often make the mistake of thinking you have to go the other way. Why? Because they believe in enlightenment reason. Enlightenment reason says if you want to communicate with someone and convince them, you should talk their language. It's fine. Language is neutral. It just fits the world. No, it doesn't. Language is not neutral. It fits frames that fit different moral systems in politics. Very crucial point, and a lot of point many Democrats miss. Why? Because they went to college. <laughs> now, I'm, not, I'm, I'm quite serious. Um, uh, suppose you are a conservative and you take a business course in college. In your curriculum, there will be marketing. And the marketing professors study psychology, how people really think. Right? So conservatives have no problem marketing their ideas using all of this stuff. But liberals who want to go into politics study political science, law, public policy, and economics. And they learn the rational actor model and uh, enlightenment reason. They learn a false theory of reason. And that false theory of reason leads them not to understand how brains work. It leads them not to understand that they, shouldn't, that they should use their language about their moral systems, not the other guy's language. It, leads them, it means that they don't understand they have to set up a system of communication where they repeat. Rep repetition is what changes brains. Even if it were true that everybody thought according to tra tra traditional reason, the fact that thought is physical means if you convince someone and somebody, you're changing their brain. Changing brains is not manipulation. It is smart in politics. That's how it works. And the conservatives have been doing this consistently since the 1960s in, 
you know, I, I could go through all the institutions and so on that they've set up for it. But it's that. Mind change is brain change. Arguing against com opponents using their language and negating the frame just helps them. Okay? Example. Uh, how many of you saw Bill Clinton's speech? Okay? Uh, I liked it. I thought it was a great speech. And what he did was he corrected the misconceptions, right? So the next day I walk into class and I say, okay, did you see Clinton's speech? Yes. What was great about it? He corrected all the false claims, okay? Uh, you know, the, he gave us the truth, uh, the real facts. All right. How many of you remember the facts? Tell me, how many of you remember at least one fact? One person in this class of 40 at Berkeley, very smart undergraduates, remembered three facts. And that was it for the whole class. Now, how many people remembered the Republican claims that Clinton was arguing against? Everybody. Think about that for a moment. And they, this was brought up on Fox News, and one of the Romney advisors said, this Clinton's speech doesn't matter. People won't remember what he said. It's not entirely true, because what he got across was you can't trust them, even though people might not remember the exact facts. So it did have a major effect, but not the effect that a lot of liberals thought it had. I mean, you'd have to carry the, the thing around with you to remember all of them, unless you're a political junkie like me. Now, um, this is important, because if you turn on MSNBC, you will see uh, lots of people uh, using uh, the other guy's language and arguing against them by negating their frames, and therefore strengthening them. Okay. Notice it. Next time you turn on liberal pundits, notice. Now, the big thing about this, about morality, is morality is all metaphorical. And that's not obvious, but it's true. Morality is about well-being, your well-being and the well-being of others. And that is registered chemically in the brain. We have pathways for um, positive and negative emotions. Okay? That is things that, that, are, that have to do with our well-being and our ill-being. The positive emotion pathways go past things like happiness, awe, satisfaction, and so on. The negative ones go past things like uh, anger, sadness, fear, uh, disgust, and so on. Okay? So the way to think about this is think about the metaphors for morality you're going to learn on the basis of the activation of satisfaction and dissatisfaction uh, pathways paired with other experiences because that's how you learn primary metaphors. When they're paired, you learn the, the circuitry. And you ask, OK, when you're a child, uh, which is better, eating pure food or rotten food? Pure food. Morality is purity. Immorality is rottenness. Something is even rotten in the state of Denmark. Okay? That was a rotten thing to do. Purification rituals occur around the world. Every one-year-old knows that it's, you're better off if you can stand upright than if you have to crawl on the ground. So morality is being upstanding. Immorality is being a low-down snake. Morality is light. Immorality is darkness because you're better off if you're functioning in the light than in the dark. Around the world, you get uh, things like this. In, in Japanese, you have the hara, center of emotions. Having a black hara is being immoral. In Hmong, having a black liver is being immoral. In Swahili, having a black stomach is being immoral. Nothing to do with skin color. It has to do with light and dark. Uh, morality is beauty. Immorality is ugliness. That was a beautiful thing to do. You're better off if you're good looking than if you're not, even as a baby. All right? Things are getting ugly around here. As uh, Perry said, uh, you know, if uh, so-and-so uh, Bernanke comes to Texas, it's going to get ugly. Now, uh, well-being is wealth. You, you're better off if you have the things you need than if you don't. And then you have moral accounting. If I do you a favor that increases your well-being, you say, I'm in your debt. How can I repay you? You know, I owe you one, right? 
moral action is accumulating moral credit, and moral action is balancing the moral books in, in these cases. Morality is you're better off if you listen to your parents than if you don't. So morality is obedience to legitimate authority. You're better off if your parents nurture the, you than if you don't. Morality is nurturance. And this answers a mystery, that the mystery that led me to write moral politics. I wondered in 1994, when the, when the conservatives took over Congress, why these were very strange people. They were against taxation and against abortion. What do they have to do with each other? They're against unions and worker rights. What does that have to do with abortion? They're against environmentalism. What does that have to do with taxation? They're against, therefore, laissez-faire markets. What does that have to do with abortion? They're for the use of military strength. Uh, what does that have to do with worker rights? They're for corporate personhood, for, you know, for tort reform, against public employee benefits, against public programs. What do they have to do with each other? Now, I looked at this, and I said, what is going on here? Uh, and so I said, OK, I'm against all of the, I have the opposite views and all of these. What do they have to do with each other for me? I'm a cognitive scientist, and I got embarrassed because I didn't know. But it's a cognitive science problem, and I took it on. And it turned out that the answer to that was contained in those metaphors for morality. Because you get two models of the family, a strict father family and a nurturing parent family. And the strict father family is the one that is the basis of conservatism under a certain metaphor. So let me first tell you about that metaphor. When are you first governed? In your family. So you learn that a governing institution is a family. It could be a church, it could be a team, it could be a classroom, or a nation. Okay. Now, there are two models of the family that are prominent in America. You may or may not be raised under one or the other. You may have both in your family. But they go like this, and they're in our culture. Uh, the strict father family has Father knows best, knows right from wrong. He's the ultimate authority. No one in the family has moral authority. He must preserve that authority. Authority, no backtalk. Authority must be maintained. The father protects and supports uh, the family financially. Uh, children learn morality by being punished for disobedience. Punishment is morally required of the father. And it must be painful or the child will never learn what's right and to stop doing what's wrong. Morality requires discipline. So if you're undisciplined, you can't be moral. What does that mean? If you're disciplined, you can go out in the world and earn a living. If you're not earning a living, then you can't be disciplined, which means you can't be moral, which means you deserve your poverty. So the best people are the people who make the most money. Surprise, surprise. Uh, all responsibility is personal responsibility. Follows from this, you are responsible. Uh, every adult is responsible for satisfying their own interests. There's one-way communication. Uh, the father in the family is responsible for reproduction decisions. Adults are responsible for their children. What does this explain? We're about to be done. There's another one, which is nurturance. Parents have equal responsibility to empathize with their children, et cetera. It explains, for example, uh, why it is that you can be uh, pro-life and for the death penalty. It explains okay, why. You're pro-life because in the strict father family, the father is the person who determines reproduction. And therefore, if they're going to be a child, he doesn't want it aborted because he's determined it. And so he'll be against abortion. And for parental notification and spousal notification and so on. And all of those rights. That is, men will be responsible for women's reproduction in the strict father family. You apply that to conservatives, and it turns out that the conservative views on this activate the entire moral system. And it was not stupid for conservatives to be advocating this. It activates the rest of their system. You apply it to the market. It says the market is the decider. Let the market decide. That means there should be nothing above the market. What is above the market? Regulation, taxation, worker rights, and tort cases, all the things conservatives are against. Now, we can go through this bit by bit. The book Moral Politics spells it out in 500 pages of easy to read detail. <laughs> Cheap. <laughs> OK.
So that's the general idea. Uh, biconceptuals have both. There's no ideology of the middle, et cetera. Freedom. The freedom to start a business when you have roads and you have all the other things you need and re-government research. The freedom to live a decent life. You've got to have roads and sewers and, oh, and health and, and, uh, and all those other things. For conservatives, democracy is based on a different moral principle. It's the freedom of citizens to seek their own interests regardless of the interests of others. Those who succeed deserve to. Those who don't succeed don't deserve to. And this imposes a moral hierarchy, which should be reflected in political and economic power. What it says is democracy is about liberty, the liberty to seek your own interests without any government interference, without anybody interfering with you, and without anybody helping you. You don't have to help anybody else, and nobody else is supposed to help you. Okay? That's what you saw in those two conventions, and that's what this is about. Smaller government is actually a government that Im imposes and supports that moral system. It's not necessarily smaller because it, conservatives by that mean that it's a government that gets rid of the public provisions. Right? It might increase defense. They might have a bigger deficit. But that doesn't count as a deficit. A deficit for Republicans is only a deficit caused by public provisions to help people, not a deficit caused by wars or a deficit caused by increased military spending. It's not part of the concept deficit. They mean different things. So for progressives, if the Ryan budget goes through, it will defund all public provisions. By 2050, 91% of all public provisions will be gone. And as they defund institutions, they destroy them. What this means is destroying the moral basis of democracy. Thank you. Wow. Uh, so uh, thank you once again, George. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have uh, <laughs> Uh, Heather, uh, Professor Heather Hendershot uh, here, moderate discussion. We'll have questions from audience members as well. So we're going to ask, because all of this is being recorded, is for audience members to go to the mics on either side of the room in order to ask your questions. I know a lot of people want to have a uh, commentary, express yourselves, uh, have uh, answers and engagement, so try to keep the questions uh, relatively uh, brief here. Uh, and so. Uh, without further ado, I'll just turn it over to uh, Heather. Great, thanks. And I think we also have people who can help pass the microphones too. Sometimes it's a little hard to get up if you're right in the middle and get to the aisle. But just raise your hand and we'll make sure you get amplified somehow. Um, well, it was a very provocative talk. I can, I can see people like, oh, I'm dying to say something. So let's open it up. We have a good 20 minutes. We might go over a few minutes. Um, who would like to kick off our first? Yes. OK, I'll ask the obvious question. How do you? How would you suggest or give us some examples of how you would have a conversation with, quote, the other side? So It depends on whether they're total conservatives or whether they're partially biconceptual. And most conservatives are biconceptual in some ways. They have certain progressive ideas. Uh, there's a whole chapter of, uh, uh, on this at the end of a book called uh, Don't Think of an Elephant. And there's what I tell my students when they say, I'm going to go to uh, Thanksgiving and uh, my grandfather is going to be there, and we always have a fight. Right. And I say, look, don't fight with your grandfather. Ask him the following question. What are you most proud of uh, in helping, uh, doing something for someone else, for other people? What are you most proud of? And they come back, and they say, 
I never knew my grandfather did three really important good things in the world. Maybe not others, but at least three good ones, and they were really very good, and we talk about them every time we get together. And I respect them for at least doing three good things. And that's the best you can do in a lot of cases. But it's, a, it's an interesting thing, because conservatism has a lot of in-group pr um, uh, progressivism, in-group nurturance and out-of-group you know, uh, apply their, right. own, their normal right. moral theory. And you see this in the army. Right. The army is inside, the army is a socialist collective. Uh, you know, and it's, you know, just think about it for a minute, and that's, that's how they work, this in-group nurturance. And this was provoked beautifully by Michelle Obama and uh, Jill Biden in their talks. Because what they did was they talked about helping out veterans' families, which evoked nurturance about the army and about the military. And it, what it did was evoke their moral system in a discussion of the military, which is vitally important. And not one pundit noticed it. OK, um, thank you. Uh, who's next? Here we go. Uh, Chris Peterson, Comparative Media Studies. Um, Professor, I read your critique, um, What Orwell Didn't Know. Yeah. Uh, and while I agree with your point that Orwell had suffered from the editor's fallacy of thinking that words had discrete meanings and everything, I had always thought that the point of his essay was that metaphors kind of structured not only what we thought, but what it was capable for us to think. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about where you saw the gap between what Orwell understood and what you understand. He certainly understood that. And, and I said that. I mean, he, you know, I'm a big Orwell fan and have always been. But Orwell thought that it was possible simply to tell people the facts and they would reason to the right uh, conclusion, and he was wrong. And this is important to understand. You can only understand what the brain circuits you have allow you to understand. And if you don't have enough available brain circuitry that, is, that needs to be recruited, every time you learn something, you're, you're recruiting pretty much circuitry that's not used for anything in particular, strengthening it so it can be used. You're doing brain change. If those appropriate circuits are not available, the facts won't mean anything to somebody. And that happens with extreme conservatives. You can, you know, they can hear Clinton's speech, it'll go in one ear and out the other. Yes. Hi, Daniel Lois Deitch, uh, Media Psychology. And um, I know you have a colleague down south in uh, Emory, uh, Drew Weston. Uh, he's more, I guess, of a neuroscientist. Um, Actually, he's not. He's a clinical psychologist who has worked once with a neuroscientist. OK. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. And he did um, a very nice job. So you wrote The Political Mind. He wrote The Political Brain. Um, I've read both of them. And I was just curious what you see as the distinctions between what each of you say, and if there's anything, not to start a feud between you two, but if there's anything that uh, you guys disagree on. I know there's a lot you agree on, and you actually reference each other a number of times, but. Um, we agree on many things, but there, is, there are a couple of major disagreements that are important. Uh, first, um, you know, he, he isn't a neuroscientist, uh, you know, although he did, was involved in, in this. I'm not a neuroscientist either. Uh, he's a clinical psychologist. Uh, he uh, believes in enlightenment reason. And, he believe, and, and all of the things he suggests to the Democrats are enlightenment reason arguments. You know, get, you know, get the facts out there and argue strongly. He correctly believes that emotion is important, that you should do it emotionally and use emotional rhetoric. He correctly believes that you need to use narratives and stories. He's absolutely right on all of those calls. But he misses by conceptualism. He, his suggestions are often to move to the right, to move, to quote, to, as he would say, to the, to the active center. He's more of a centrist than a progressive, uh, although he, he has uh, uh, you know, written extensively against Obama's centrist positions. Uh, and otherwise, he's a very, very smart, very articulate uh, person, uh, you know. And we have just those those disagreements. Thank you. I have 
just going to interject one here. How would you account for uh, differences among Republicans, for example, or not Republicans, conservatives? Um, for example, that uh, the fact that uh, there are libertarians who identify themselves as person by conceptual or they're actually legitimately very different kinds or is an equal or compelling body what they should do. Same thing. And have the force to back it up, but we don't have enough of a military now, we need more. Okay? So that's part of it. There's another part, which is the fact that when you support the military, you support the military industrial complex, which is you're supporting corporations, which is another part of the Romney.
father morality. I mean, when you start going into the deep and who's more moral is by looking at, um, in a well-ordered universe, ordered by God, who has been ruling in the past. You know, God above man, man above nature, uh, Western culture above non-Western culture, adults above children, uh, men above women, uh, straights above gays, Christians above non-Christians, etc., cetera, et cetera. Got it? There's a moral hierarchy there. Not all conservatives have all of it. They all have things like America above other countries and Western culture above, above non-Western culture and man above nature and so on. But you know, not all of them are bigots by any means, but, but it's, part of, it's an extension of the same hierarchy that you get. Now, uh, another very important uh, feature when you study the system in detail is that uh, just as in a strict father family, the authority of the father must be maintained so the authority of conservatism must be maintained and spread. That is, the highest value in that system is maintaining and pre preserving that system itself. And that explains something, a number of things, but one of them is why conservatives would vote As you get an, a, an ultra-conservative Congress in there, they're going to vote against anything that would help Obama because that would go against their moral principles of doing something that would hurt their own moral system. Yes. Yeah, uh, George Mokra, I'm an independent <laughs> scholar. One of the most interesting things that I saw within the last year in public discourse was an interview on MSNBC, uh, no, it was on Current TV, with uh, one of the occupiers. And the interesting thing about, one of the interesting things about the occupiers is of course, as soon as they're introduced, they say, well, I can't speak for Occupy, I can only speak for myself. Right. And this was at the time when the New York police were supposedly taking drug addicts and drunks and other troublesome people and saying, go to Zuccotti Park, go there, go there, go there. And the interviewer was asking about that and trying to
I was listening to uh, NPR one day when uh, The World had an interview uh, with the uh, British ambassador from Sierra Leone, and there was a British interviewer. And she asked the ambassador about truth and reconciliation. He explained, uh, you know, they had done these awful things, but they were going to get them out in the open, let everybody know about them, and then stop. And the interviewer said, In this presidential campaign, it seems like Barack Going to miss compound, so it's not really a <laughs> pure Who story. Is this? I, I didn't uh, hear it. Romney's grandfather is a Mexican immigrant from a polygamous compound, yes, so right. it doesn't really resonate purely for him. Well, he didn't mention that, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, you, you get you get the drift of this, and then he's heroic because Bain Capital saved Staples, <laughs> not mentioning the ones they destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> and not mentioning the kind of business that they were in. I mean, you know, but this is the, the, the general way that this goes in this country. Those are major uh, narratives that you expect politicians to have, and the Obama campaign has them. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they will or won't work for the election or for the election of other Democrats, but they're there. And what's interesting is uh, the reaction to that in the... Uh, in the convention hall, because not everybody in that convention hall was uh, pro-Obama on everything. There were a lot of people there who were much more progressive than Obama, and they cheered those narratives too. I mean, those narratives are important in our culture, and uh, they're using them. Whether they'll work, I can't say. 
Thanks. I think we have time for a few more questions. Sure. Um, yes. Hi, uh, I'm Colin McDonald. I'm studying computer and uh, political science right now. And uh, I read a book by Richard Thaler. Um, and he's also trying to kind of apply yeah. know, cognitive science to politics. So um, for anybody who hasn't read Nudge, um, I guess he's trying to suggest that the government should use the heuristics and biases that we know about the human brain uh, to try and make them uh, make better decisions. And so I was wondering if you think that's a good idea, a bad idea, I don't know. It depends on what the decisions are. <laughs> right. uh, some of them have been pretty bad and some okay. Uh, what you have, yeah, I mean, yeah, you have Cass Sunstein was in the Obama administration until recently. Uh, and so was the, and Cass Sunstein was uh, in the position of pushing cost-benefit analysis. Now, everybody in this audience will recognize the um, equation for cost-benefit analysis. It's an integral, and it's an integral uh, uh, over a particular action. Um, and it starts at one time and ends at another time, and it has a factor of e to the minus dt, where d is the interest or discount rate, which means and everything must be translated into money, all this, th everything there. So let's take the environment for an environmental thing. You, for, you, know, uh, you take the, the benefit minus the cost times e to the minus dt. Well. Uh, what that means is e to the minus dt, as you know, goes down exponentially with time, so that any environmental benefit uh, goes down exponentially with time and goes to zero very quickly, which means you shouldn't be using it for the environment. But they do, and Cass Sunstein did. I don't like that, one. Two, this is part of uh, what uh, uh, is being used uh, to decide what medical tests should be given to people. So, for example, there's an argument that uh, on cost-benefit analysis terms that women uh, who are 40 should not get, uh, uh, you know, uh, tested for breast cancer. They should wait until they're 50 because it's only an extra, you know, 3% of women who would get breast cancer in that time. Uh, multiply that by 150 million women and you get a number like 45,000, and uh, you don't want to talk about 45,000 deaths, even though it's only 3%. Uh, somehow, some of these uses are not beneficial. Some of them can be. Uh, the ones they always talk about are terrific. You know, uh, you know do you uh, tell somebody uh, that they have a choice to, to have a uh, retirement plan, or do you just tell them they have a time retirement plan and can opt out? You know, if they have to opt out, that takes more effort, so more people opt in, which is beneficial. They're absolutely right about that. And, you know, it really depends upon the particular cases. But the idea of using it across the board, as Thaler and Sunstein suggest, I think is immoral. Thank you. Um, we have... We have time for just one more question. Could we okay. take yours, please? Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. I'm an urban planner, and uh, I hear a lot uh, this kind of spatial metaphor also in a political context of uh, top-down versus bottom-up. And uh, people who use this metaphor usually say that top-down is somehow bad and bottom-up is always very positive. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I noticed that uh, the notion of bottom-up, uh, people talk about very different things, uh, both on the, red, uh, on the left and on the right, uh, when they talk about uh, bottom-up. So I, I wanted to ask you about uh, a comment on, on, on this uh, very frequent uh, uh, metaphor. Um, again, the issue is um, what it's about. Uh, so you have uh, an idea, let's say, um, uh, in the um, case of the 1% versus the 99%, uh, the folks who were uh, out there demonstrating uh, for the 99% had a bottom-up view in such a case that it never went up. That was a disaster. We needed them to be moving up, to be actually saying something beyond individuals saying something. Uh, there was a, a very lo a great lost opportunity, and I'm sad that that happened. Uh, Top-down isn't always bad. Bottom-up isn't always good, bottom-up isn't always bad, top-down isn't always good, and so on. It depends on the case. 
uh, there are cases where you really need a leader to do something. When you need a leader to do something, you need it to be top down. There are cases where ordinary people uh, have to be able to have the ideas first before it can happen. As Obama says, make me do it. Start a movement. Make me do it. Well, in many cases, that's right. In other cases, it's really a bad idea, and you need leadership. It depends on the particular case and the particular situation. Thank you. I know we have, uh, you all have a lot more questions, but um, we are out of time. And apparently, even though uh, Professor Lakoff's books are very long, they're very read readable, and they're sold at a fair price. So that would be a good way to, to continue <laughs> to and learn more about. they're not all very long. I mean, you know. Many, you, you did emphasize the five and 600 pages. Oh, those are the big ones. They, oh, they, okay. The little blue book is, a, is very short. Don't Think of an Elephant is very short. Metaphors We Live By is very short. You know, there are a lot of very short books. Very good. So you can read those books there to, uh, to follow is. through. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you all very much for coming. Right. Right. Yeah, and so we'd also like to thank uh, Heather for her job moderating. I just want to mention uh, briefly the final talk in this year's uh, uh, Cognitive Dimensions of Media series by the uh, ICE Lab and Comparative Media Studies Department will be by uh, Mark Turner, who co-authored uh, uh, More Than Cool Reason with uh, uh, Professor uh, George Lakoff here. He'll be here in November, so stay, out, stay on the lookout for that one uh, as well. Also, we'll engage the news. And finally, join me in thanking uh, George Lakoff one more time before we leave for the evening. Yeah.